Let us correct such apprehension, for the mind was never split, for there is but one mind, and that is the mind of God, which is perfect mind, of which man is a perfect part, spiritually so, but regrettable to say he is not using it. Now as that which God made out of that which he created became a denser form of that which man now calls matter, may we repeat, the involution of the soul became retarded, and therefore could not radiate its perfection to its fullest extent through that which God made out of that which he created. That was the battle in consciousness. Man is further deluded to believe, and that is regrettable to say, to state that heaven is a state or place geographically reached, which is not true. The separation in consciousness would give its appearance as a separation, but in reality it would be a separation as if in parts or levels. And this is what we are endeavoring to do, to bring all parts or levels back into oneness. For the Master Jesus said, as in heaven, so in earth. But the translator said, as in heaven, so on earth. In one of our earlier lessons, we said that the physical body was of the earth, earthy. Man is not of the three-dimensional world. He is of the fourth-dimensional world. The fourth dimensional world is the creative power of all that is, and of which man is the most intricate part thereof. It is where the union of will and love take place. It is the wedding feast of Cana, where the water was turned into wine, and it made them merry, did it not? What happens when the involution of the soul keeps in rapport with the evolution of the physical temple? There must then be perfection in the flesh, must there not? It is the turning of the what into what? In the story of the wedding of Cana, even as it is narrated in the present-day Holy Writ, does it not set state that the Galilean turned the water into wine? It created no destruction. They became happy and feasted, did they not? Therefore, then, when man gets back upon the path, and we may use that term, of spiritual realization, of realizing his oneness with the perfect creative power of the universe, the involution of his soul continues, continues and eradicates all imperfection from the flesh temple which he has brought about by that which man calls error. And for the want of teaching man something of error, the earlier theological body of the theologians created an entity which they called by name a devil. They conceived him with horns, cloven hooves, a tail, and a pitchfork. Is that right? Then they created a fiery abyss, placed him in the fiery abyss, to reign there forever. That is mythology. Now, you erase the letter D from the word devil, and you have the truth of the existing devil or satanic majesty, if you please. It is evil. And when man continues to practice evil... It is because he thinks evil first. You cannot practice good or truth until you have first thought it. Neither can you practice anything until you have first thought it. Therefore, the great myth, the great fable of theology, the devil having walked too far to the edge because he was angry with God, and in his anger he fell from heaven to earth, and then to that place created for him called Hades or hell, that is all mythology. It is the descent in consciousness. Now let us reason in this wise. We will accept for the sake of proof to our statement that your orthodox theo theologians are correct in saying that man of earth can be saved from his sins. We shall accept that temporarily, if that is possible. How is this brought about? Man listens to the fiery-tongued theologians, the evangelists, the pilgrims of God and their fiery sermons, many of which are based on fear changes his thinking, and therefore he has become saved. Is this correct? Let us come to truth. Does it necessitate a silver-tongued orator, or does it take a fiery-tongued theologian to teach the truth? Is it necessary for the teacher of truth to paint a beautiful picture of heaven with cherubims and seraphims flying about, and opposite to it paint a picture of that which he calls hell with crackling embers, fire, and brimstone? The teacher of truth paints no such picture, yet truth teaches man to change his thinking. 
Thus man, God-man, comes back on the path of involution of the soul, thus evolving the physical temple and bringing it into rapport and unity through the process of evolution. Because of the evolution, the constant and continued growth of the soul brings a flesh temple, that which God made out of that which God created, back upon the path of that which theology calls righteousness, or right use of mind consciousness. Now is this understandable to you? There is only one heaven out of which to fall, and that is when man degrades himself in consciousness, mind you, that well. For as a man liveth in consciousness, in truth and in honor, so shall he live in earth, as above, so below. As he lives in heaven, in earth, he radiates that to his fellow man. Therefore, in our instructions, we have admonished you, never proselytize. Let your light so shine that your fellow man shall see it. Do not place your light under a bushel. Remember when the master said, And I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all mankind to me. He was referring to the ascension of consciousness into the infinite light or the I am. The one who lives in truth and does not find fault with his neighbor or his fellow man. The one who lives in truth is not given over to slander or gossip. The one who lives in truth, when he shares his love and his earthly goods, seeks no glory for it. Thus his fellow man says, how can they do it? What do they possess that makes of them such very singular individuals? Thus the neighbor, the fellow man, shall seek to know more about you and your philosophy of life. Thus the so-called hidden mystery of his brother is revealed. Humility, humility, humility. The Nazarene knew, for he said, Let not the right hand know what the left hand doeth. There is another age-old statement. It is, Human to error, it is divine to forgive. These are not just coined words, for they are definite, positive, accurate, deliberate statements of truth. As we pass among you, though we are unseen to human eye, we hear many say, It is difficult to live as a student or a seeker of truth. Well, it may so appear to some that it is difficult, but, beloved, it is not difficult. Remember, all that which you now possess, which leads to your com lends to your comfort, physically speaking, and permits you and other indulgences not enjoyed by many of your fellow men, these comforts and possessions are not just an accumulation of this incarnation. They are the re reward of every good you have done as you have crossed life's sands. That is why individuals have crossed your path, where you could share, and as you have wisely and lovingly shared, you have multiplied your good. In every life's pattern, the bread that is cast upon the waters of life in love unselfishly shall return to the giver or the one who cast the bread. For every good there is a goodness, and for every goodness there is another good, and for every good there shall come another goodness. Love begets love, goodness begets goodness. That action and its equal attraction is the involution of the soul in rapport with the evolution of that which is known as physical body and its environment and circumstance. When the involution of the soul becomes retarded, there is evidence of stagnation of the physical body and its environment and circumstances, for progress shall never spell mortal retrogression. Does this sound reasonable to you? Therefore, it is wise for man to remain close to God, for the kingdom of God is in man's consciousness. Where God is, heaven is, and every pure, clean, white, bright, happy, harmonious thought is an angel in heaven. As man creates angels and sends them forth out into that which man knows as the universe, there shall return to him the manifestation of what he sent out. Remember, as above, so below, as in heaven, so in earth. A prayer of comfort, a prayer of peace, a prayer of love is an angel, dear hearts, a loving, protecting angel in God's heaven.